Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Okay, so we are now in the bonus section of our uh, Libertarian Counterpoint Podcast, and we have a comment from Scott Schmidt. Uh, It stops contagion. Common sense. School should remain closed. Um, Okay, so this is about the uh, school issue, and uh, as far as at least my understanding. I don't know if you guys wanted to jump in. I had some thoughts on it, but uh, did you? Either of you guys want to jump in first? No, go ahead. I want to hear what what you have to say. It's fine. It's fine with me. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we've been. Uh, you know, personally, I've been thinking a lot about it because I do have kids in school, so uh, who are affected by this, and so I I think that there's there's a few issues here. One is uh, just the lockdowns in general. Um, you know, it's not democratic. I mean, it's not like we've been asked about this or uh, discussed it. Uh, It literally is edicts from on high. So, I mean, I I have a problem with that, Um, you know, because you say stops contagion. Everything is essentially uh, a risk. You know, you take a risk leaving your house in the morning. You take a risk just about doing everything. And we all have to make different value judgments on those risks. And so to, to simply say, well, the doctors told us there is a risk and therefore we don't do anything. Um, one of the things that's been made pretty clear to us by many sources, and I think including the American Academy of Pediatrics, I think, um, is that there, there's almost no risk to kids in this uh, thing now. Exactly. You know, and, and they're also uh, not as likely to transmit either, which is extraordinarily surprising. But then we've been hearing all kinds of crazy information from our government on this, including masks and everything else. Um, but uh, but it, as far as that goes, uh, I, I guess it, at the very least, I'd, I'd want it to be a little more democratic, uh, a little more input. Um, it's funny, you know, I mean, this is one of the things with uh, Trump and the uh, the Supreme Court decision that knocked his DACA thing out. You know, that was about procedure of all things. And essentially that he wasn't engaging the public in these you know uh, discussions to go forward. And I find it kind of odd that, you know, uh, for something as, as serious as our private property rights of our businesses, our livelihoods, and kids going to school, that uh, that we literally would not want to have a voice in that. Would just say, "Hey, whatever, whatever Mr. Scientist tells us, that's what we're right. going to do." And and it's not, you know, in the end, scientists deliver data to us, and it's up to us to uh, put our value judgments into how exactly how to weigh that data. So, uh, did, did either of you guys want to jump in farther? Well, well, you know, with, all, with all due respect to to, um, to Scott, well, I mean, I don't know him, but with all due respect, I mean, every morning, I'm sure when the, when the schools are open, he take his kids and bundle them into his car and drive them down to the drive them down to the school. There's a risk in that. There's a risk in that. Every year, we have how many people die on our on our roads and and and, and are injured on our roads. There's a risk in it. So yes, there's there may be some small risk. Of, of of infection with 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 kids, but that can be mitigated, like we mitigate like you mitigate the risk of driving by driving a little more carefully, a little bit slower, whatever it is you do to mitigate your risk in driving, when you when you're driving your kids around, the same thing could be done with the COVID. I mean, there are businesses that are open. I go to Costco all the time, Walgreens, Home Depot. They are mitigating the risk. I've not heard a single person say yet. You know, I got infected because I went to Costco. I haven't, I haven't heard that yet. But Costco have 100,000 people. I don't know what the number is, but it's probably in the 100,000 going through their stores every day. But the point is, though, the point <coughs> is, though, we learn to mitigate the risk. And we're probably going to be dealing with the COVID for some time. I don't know. Okay, we, 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 we things were looking good. The resurgence came back. And, 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 and here we are again. And now we, we locked down here in California again. So we may have to learn to live with this thing. And if we're going to have to live with it, we have to learn to mitigate the risk and manage the risk. That's all. Okay. Uh, yeah. Manage, manage the risk like we do other risks. Um, I, I think, uh, so Scott's saying it's, it's common sense to keep schools closed because it, it stops the contagion, perhaps. Well, it, it doesn't stop it, but it, uh, it would probably slow it to keep the schools closed. Uh, I think you could probably 
make a case that uh, if if keeping schools closed and not educating children was uh, without any side effects, any unintended consequences, uh, any opportunity cost whatsoever, that uh, it would probably stop or slow contagion uh, more than if you opened them up because kids catch everything. They're inside of a uh, of a closed uh, building and uh, breathing everybody else's air. And so if one kid comes in and has COVID, <clears throat> they're likely to give it to the other kids, you know, three or four, or who knows, maybe all of them. And then they're all going to go home and they're going to give it to their parents who may be, you know, less uh, able to, uh, to handle it than the kids because of their youth and so on. So that's, that's the one argument, but the other argument is that there is an opportunity cost. There is unintended consequences with keeping kids at home, and you have to recognize that. Okay, it just is so it's not just an automatic slam dunk, no brainer decision to keep schools closed because there is a cost, and it's and and you have and at some point you have to just. You know, have to just deal with uh, kids getting sick and bring it into their parents and, and the, for the contagion to continue. Because, you know, this just isn't going to go away for a very long time. And until right. we either develop herd immunity or we a develop vaccine. a vaccine that yeah. works and is effective and so on, we're, we're in it. And, you know, like it or not, you know, and yeah, will people die? Yeah. But, you know, do you want to just have a uh, entire generation of kids that <laughs> it's bad enough now, the education system. And Tell me so about it. I'm, I'm de what I'm doing right now is I'm defending sending kids to an education system that's busted. You know, <laughs> Scott's, Scott's <laughs> argument. Scott's argument may be able to be made even without COVID. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of like drawn to Scott's yeah. argument already. So, but I have to say that you, there, but, there still is unintended consequences. Yeah. So whatever we do, do nothing, do something. It's all got cost involved. Yeah. There yeah. but, 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 you know, Tim, that brings up, you know, what Leon was saying earlier, and that's competition with schools, you know, and I mean, I, I think that's the real answer is to have competition, not necessarily to say, well, it's either binary, either we have the terrible situation we currently have uh, with brick and mortar schools, or we, we simply have them remotely teach what they've been teaching through brick and mortar yeah. school. <laughs> all, the garbage, all, the, yeah. all the indoctrination, all the propaganda. Pro yeah. Just yeah. Send it through, them through the digital, through the internet. Exactly. Do well, but, yeah. This is the beauty too. If we had competition, we would have different schools trying different methods to see how they can safely teach the kids. Yeah, but we like have the like the yeah. Ron Paul curriculum, for example. Yeah. There's one. There you go. Yeah. That'd be a good one. Yeah. yeah. And if I wanted to send, if I wanted to send my kid to the Ron Paul school of of whatever of liberty, whatever it is, then that is my right. I will send it, send my kid there if that is what I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. And there's another yeah. thing that there's another thing that um that is in here that we we didn't mention yet. You know, in the, in the, in the in the in the Western world, in the developed world. All, the other, all every other country, I believe, I, I don't know if there are any exceptions, the schools are open or going to open. They are going to do yeah. it. So what? why are those people going to gonna open their schools? And we, yeah. our kids yeah. are so special that we have to keep them home. There's why? a few that there's a few that never open, Leon. And then there's some, I, I mean, excuse me, a few that never close. close. Yeah. Right. And then there's uh, then quite a few of them are reopening. They're reopening with different caveats, like maybe reducing class sure. group sizes sure. and other things like that to try and mitigate, uh, you know, uh, the problem. But but essentially, th this brings up a huge issue back to the trade-offs that Tim was talking about. And, um, you know, if, if our kids are literally hobbled by a year or two of staying at home for fear of a of a half a percent chance of, of what could happen to, to one of their family members, I, I you know, I mean, they're literally impacting the trajectory of their lives. I mean, essentially, you're, you're talking about on a competitive basis with all these kids who are going to school in the rest of the world where our kids are 
sitting at home and maybe getting, you know, a couple hours of FaceTime with their teachers a week, you know, right. on Zoom right. or something with a, you know, with, yeah. which is all trial and error. I mean, they, they haven't vetted any of this stuff. It's yeah. literally just a train wreck as it goes out. So it's not like we're talking about a system that's been vetted and they know it works. We're talking about literally a crash course. They're saying this is a Band-Aid because we don't know what else to do and we don't want to risk anything. And, and, and this is a, a massive transfer of from, old, uh, from, from young to old. You know, a lot of times, you know, we think about it as, you know, the, the very young benefiting from the older people. But in this case, I mean, oh, my gosh. I mean, you're talking about kids who are missing their senior year of school and all of the, the uh, milestones that go into that and, and, you know, maybe missing their SAT tests and all kinds yeah. of other stuff like that or, or having trouble figuring that stuff out. I mean, all of the chaos going into that. You know, man, you think about a kid who's working on a scholarship, you know, and boom, you know, something like this comes up and maybe he's missed his sports scholarship or something. Sure. I, we are literally – uh, affecting these kids' lives to where we may be damaging their whole lives at, for uh, a transfer of risk to people who are we're, we're super concerned about, and we should be concerned about them, but to, to just say that the kids have no choice and we are literally just going to shift all these resources to, to protect people who are, you know, 65, 85 plus, you know, to me, it seems very, very uh, upside down. It is. It is. It, 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 the, the, the whole the whole idea. I mean, given given um, um, Scott Scott's question, the, we, we the, you the, you're making it sound like there's some utopian world out there that we can live in with no risk. There's no such thing. I mean, I have to climb up and down the steps in my own home to come to do this show. I could have probably not make it. Because I'm home alone right now. I could have been sitting at the bottom of the steps, injured, God. and you guys are never getting to hear my wonderful <laughs> statements. <laughs> now that's dangerous. You see what I mean? Leon, yes, yes. home alone. <laughs> yes, I'm home alone. <laughs> We're risking your ideas versus your, <laughs> your dangerous ideas. Yeah. <laughs> it's the danger it's to your dangerous. health. <laughs> <laughs> which but which I, I don't. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I, I appreciate Scott's uh, question. No, I think that's uh, yeah. You know, sure, it's good to bring sure. it up. Definitely. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's good. And anytime we have a chance to argue amongst ourselves, that's great. <laughs> and speaking of arguing amongst ourselves, I did want to at least push back a little on the abortion issue too. Uh, Please. You know, oh, right. Unless, yeah, unless we get another comment. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. But uh, so uh, as far as libertarians uh, are concerned, I don't want to speak for all libertarians because like I said, they're split on this. Uh, but one of the sort of uh, the key uh, you know, people on this as far as uh, cutting edge thinkers is uh, a guy named Walter Block. And he was recently oh, in yeah. a debate on the Soho Forum yeah, um, on this. Yeah. So, you know, if you're aware of that, you can go to just Google Soho Forum. But he debated somebody on this. And um, it, it, but uh, his his theory is eviction theory is what he calls it. And so he doesn't really judge how the baby got there. Uh, what he's looking at is the conflicts and property rights between the woman and the baby and he considers it a baby so there's no question of whether he's saying it's just a lump of cells it's, wow. it's uh he's calling it a baby but what he's saying is that the woman should still have the right to evict but not kill so that's his compromise so essentially she doesn't have the right to to uh, you know push the baby out of her and then say kill the baby afterwards she has a right to push the baby out and if the baby can't survive then so be it you know and so that's kind of his compromise and and um he tries to pin that on the principles of property ownership without trying to make judgments about how the the baby got there in the first place and i i think uh, personally my my thought is is it's very hard to to kind of try and judge about how a person got pregnant and try and bring that kind of morality into it uh, so I, I kind of like his eviction theory idea but even then it doesn't dodge all the libertarian ideas because if you say that the, she she can't abort the baby, she can only evict it, then you're saying that society has a positive right to take care of the baby afterwards too, which is a libertarian problem as well, because then you're pushing uh, you know, that burden on the rest of society as well. So it's not like his his solution doesn't doesn't evade all libertarian problems, but it is it is one of the more 
sort of cutting edge compromise solutions on the subject. So you know, you I'll know, Jason, that that, that, that theory, that eviction theory, has some serious problems. Okay, and let me tell you why. Okay. Okay. Every woman, except well, Tim raised raised the correct point about about um about women who are raped. Okay. I am not talking about that, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about women who voluntarily engage in a sex act, okay? Yeah. When a woman go lay down in bed with a man or wherever in the back of a car, wherever she she choose to do it, okay? <laughs> hey, you say that like it's a bad thing. Okay. <laughs> I used to be in college, okay? I used to be in college. <laughs> Whenever a woman choose to do that, yeah. she has the right to do it. But also with that right comes a certain amount of responsibility. She's fully aware of the, of the fact that she may get pregnant in the process. If she gets pregnant, she cannot then turn back the clock and say she's going to evict the consequences of the thing that she chose to do. No, that, that could not be right. There are rights and their responsibilities. And we have to take both of them. Well, you could evict the baby if uh, it didn't mean certain death for the baby. That's the, the problem. So would you evict a tenant that wasn't paying rent from your, your house that you owned as, as a uh, slumlord or whatever you were? And uh, could you evict that tenant if it meant almost certain death for the tenant? You know, do you have a responsibility to, you know, somehow uh, protect that tenant outside of the house? But in this case, the house is the protection. It's, you know, <laughs> so... I don't know. It's just uh, to me, uh, it's, it's a it's a bad analogy. The whole tenant thing. Uh, for... it, it, it is. It is. It's a very bad analogy. Let me tell you why. Okay. If I have a well, uh, my wife and I do own rental property. If I have a tenant, I will sign a lease with that tenant, and I cannot, as long as the tenant is living up to the terms of the lease, and as long as I am living up to the terms of the lease. <laughs> There is nothing that I can do under the law that will evict that tenant, okay? When that woman, when that woman decides to lay down in the back of a car or in a bed with a man, she is signing a lease. And that lease says, if I get pregnant, I will bear this child through the normal process. You can't evict the child before while the lease is ongoing. Just like I cannot evict my tenant while he's living up or he or she is living up to the terms of the, the tenancy. No way. Yeah, what, what, Jason, what do you think? <laughs> well, I, I was going to, to put back the question of, uh, uh, do, do you then consider any abortion essentially to be murder? Is it murder or is it not murder? Because I think okay. that's a key in this, in this discussion then. That's, yeah. a, that's, a very, that's a very good question, okay? That's a very, very good question. Now, the answer to your short answer to your question is yes, except in one case. All right, in step of one case. Now, well, I really have to say I've seven three cases, really. Okay. I in think that's where, where the crux of this is gonna lie. Is in those <laughs> accepted three cases. <laughs> well, let's let's hear you out. <laughs> <laughs> in cases where the 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 tenant in this case is endangering the life of the woman, I, it cannot be murder if if the if the child has to be aborted. It cannot be, okay. In cases of rape, in cases of incest, I think a case could be made for psychological self-defense. And in that case, I think abortion cannot be murder. But everything else, yes, is murder. Everything else. You cannot, you cannot voluntarily choose to have sex with a man and then said it's on something, it's somehow inconvenient to live with the consequences of that sex act. You cannot do that. No. It, it, it only seems to me that if you're going to call it murder, then the issue really is that you have a, an innocent person who has property rights in themselves and it's being taken away by somebody else unjustly. And in the case of, of rape, it's hard to see how that also couldn't be murder, which I think is where the Catholic Church falls on it, too, I think. You know, is it, it, yes. maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Guys, but, yeah. uh, you know, they, they would call it murder as well because, you know, they're saying that. You know, well, look, you know, this is doesn't matter how it got there. You know, the bottom line is, is that, you know, you're making a conscious decision to to uh, take away its property right in itself. Yes. Yeah. 
So, I, I, you know, and then that's where I think we, you know, the, the eviction is a little bit cleaner in the sense that you're saying that, well, these, these, you know, the, the woman has a right in her own body, the baby has a right in its own body, but does the baby have a right to the woman's body? And that's, you know, because the, the woman isn't necessarily depending on the baby, but the baby is the woman. Well, you're, you're essentially saying that that's, that's um, justified because she made the choice, uh, probably made the choice, <laughs> I guess, in she most made cases choice. made the choice, yeah. Yeah. Me about yeah. If she made the choice. Now, I would agree, yeah. Jason, I would agree there's a little bit of murkiness in the cases of rape and incest, okay? But that, that's a small percentage of, 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 of the, uh, the abortion issue. I would agree there's some murkiness there. But I am arguing, I'm, a, I'm arguing in the cases of a defense of a mother's life, in the case of a rape, and in the case, and in the case of incest, you can argue for either physical self-defense or a psychological self-defense. I could, I think I can make that argument. And in those cases, I would say the choice belongs to the woman in those cases, in those with cases only. Other than that, she has to live with the responsibility of the, the act that she voluntarily chooses to engage in. Oh, signed the lease. Yeah. So if, if <laughs> yes, uh, at least you signed, she the signed mother, the lease. Yes. If the mother signed the lease, then the baby would have a right to the mother's uh, body for the length of the terms of the of the lease, which is about nine months. I it's agree. a nine month lease, and so the baby would have a right to the mother's body. Exactly. Yes. I would agree, agree with that 100 percent. Yes, it, it, it is very interesting, though, because this is the one case where we're saying that uh, a person who is not an adult has the right to enter into a contract, <laughs> at least in this analogy. <laughs> and in this case, we're saying not even one year old, not even one day old. Not even, even, not, not even born yet. Not, well, not even well, conceived well, yet. And, well, Jason, you know, <laughs> you know when your kids... You enter in the contract for your kids all the time. You agree to send yeah. them to certain schools. You agree to yeah. drive them back and forth. You enter in the contract for your kids all the time. When that woman, when that woman decides to lay down with a man, she entered in a contract for that child. That's what she did. She entered in the contract. Yeah. yeah. And then she wants, and then, and then to make matters worse, she wants to renege on the contract just because it's inconvenient. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know th th this is a little bit of tangent. I hate to go too far astray into this. And Tim, if we're butting in on your time, I don't want to. We don't, don't want to go over the hour. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, really. Um, and I I will have to uh, go pretty soon here because okay, I'm okay, up against the clock. Fine. But anyway, well, but yeah. go ahead, Jason. Well, finish up. Well, there, there was one other thought I had, and that's that we're getting into an age also where parents constantly make decisions that may not be the most healthy decisions for children, even when they're sure. in utero. You know, I mean, a, a, a parent who decides to maybe genetically modify their kid, which is going to be probably more and more a thing, you know, a, 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 a debate in the future as we go forward. And as we, as we start doing these things, at what point do we say the parent has the right to make these decisions for kids? Or do we say that the, you know, the baby has a contractual right you're saying to be naturally the way it is from that date of conception, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, cause I think we're starting to get into that murky area of, of if, if a, if a parent decides to end the life of say a, a three day old fetus, what if the parent simply decides to modify that three day old fetus? Is that also run into some of the same problems? You know, I mean, if, uh, uh, you know, if they said, I want green eyes in my kid or I want my kid to, to, you know, be, you know, I don't know, six foot six, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, I, you know, I, I, I do, I, I do see, I, I do see the, the complication of, of that. And I, I do agree. It, it raises some, some real difficult issues in, um, in, 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 in terms of, of the whole abortion debate. But I, I don't have an answer for that, that for that particular one. Maybe maybe you, should, you could ask me about that in two weeks, and I'll give you an answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that sounds that, it it, that sound. sounds like a deal. <laughs> I'd rather roll the dice and see what comes out. I don't want to. Um, I wouldn't alter if I could. I wouldn't do it. 
Uh, I think that's unnatural uh, yes. and against against nature, yes. against uh, God. If you believe in God, it's, uh, right. it's against uh, God's law and God's way of doing things. And, uh, you know, I have three kids and they're all different and I wouldn't change a thing about them. And uh, right. I didn't have any say in the matter of how they came out. They're exactly. all pretty gay. I wouldn't change that about them. I wouldn't change anything about them because I love them to death. And so... Uh, there you have it, you know. Uh, I, I didn't really have much to other than supplying half the, the DNA. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with how those uh, DNA change linked up, you know. So right. I'm fine with how they came out. And But that's me. I guess some people got to have, green, you know, kids with green eyes or something. I don't know. But that's, that's crazy talk. Yes, me. As far, as far as I'm concerned, Tim, Tim we, we totally agree on, the, on that point. Totally. We totally. Yeah. But, I mean, it, it's, really a, it's really a milky issue. But before before we have to end the show, there's one little uh, one other thing I would like I would like to add to this whole debate. In some states, I think New York is probably one of them, under certain conditions, you can have an abortion up to the point in time you're about to go into labor or, the, or while, even while you're in labor, as long as the child is not yet out of the womb, okay? Now, I find that gruesome, okay? But you know, that video you sent to us, Jason, it raised such an interesting issue. I never thought about it. What about the case of twins being born 30 minutes apart? Yeah. So one of them come out, twin number one comes out, and twin number exactly. two is still inside the womb. You want to tell me, you want to tell me that the one outside the womb is fully protected, but the one that's exactly like him or her, which is inside the womb, could be aborted on a whim just like that? No, yeah. I cannot see that. <laughs> you, you suddenly say, uh, I just realized uh, the bonus didn't come through and I don't have resources. I can only afford one. one. <laughs> Hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, but yeah, like I said, uh, the, the video Leon referenced, that's the Soho Forum debate with Walter Block uh, that aired okay. about. Uh, two or three months ago. So if you're interested, yeah. uh, that's definitely a place to go find more of it. And he's kind of arguing the more of the pro-choice side, but it's sort of a compromise. And he's arguing against somebody who's pro-life. So that's that's kind of where it, it goes. Okay. And that's the one you linked to us? In the yeah. Email? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yes. So, that's what I thought. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, uh, I can't think of anything else, uh, but uh, you've heard three dudes' uh, opinions on, <laughs> on the sensitive topic of abortion. <laughs> but a liberty yeah. warrior. Uh. <laughs> yeah, th thanks a lot, Scott. Now, here we are, still yeah. at it an hour later. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for joining us. And like I said, uh, you know, if uh, you want to listen to past podcasts, you can go to our Facebook uh, Libertarian Counterpoint page. Uh, there are probably some other places out there as well, including YouTube. And, um, you know, tune into our next one uh, and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks so much.